I just want to say um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me along. Uh, I, um, there aren't, I speak at quite a few conferences, and there aren't many organizers that put as much thought into how they structure their presentations, um, how they structure the tracks, and, and the whole process has been really impressive. So I just want to say uh, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of Flowcon, and hopefully you guys will be back next year. Um, I'm a techie, basically. I, I, have a, I am OK calling myself an architect. I'm not too embarrassed of that. I play those roles frequently. Um, but I've worked for ThoughtWorks about 10 years, and we do all kinds of things. But I started working back in about 2006, looking in the area of continuous delivery, um, working closely with clients, trying to work out how to get their software into production more quickly. And for many of those years, I focused on things like uh, infrastructure automation, you know, the early days of Puppet and Chef and all those sorts of tools, looking at using cloud providers to sort of remove some of the impediments that come from just having physical infrastructure, spending a lot of time thinking about testing of software, all as a way of trying to make sure, can I get my software, can I, can I manage the quality of my software, can I understand how healthy it is, can I ship that software as quickly as possible? And time and time again, client after client, I'd find that the main impediment would have nothing to do with infrastructure automation, or testing practices, or any of that stuff. It was actually down to the architecture of the systems themselves. That ultimately, they were not amenable to being released in a fast and frequent fashion. And so I started looking at different architectural patterns that would enable me to actually deploy my software more frequently. So looking at decomposing larger monolithic systems into finer grain systems. Uh, and that's really culminated in me and now, unfortunately, writing a book about microservices. I will be signing copies later. Um, we're looking at a type of architecture that really helps you release software fast and frequently. That's really what I got interested in in this area. Other people got interested in these sorts of architectures for need of scale, resilience, and those sorts of things, autonomy of teams, which is certainly some benefits you get from these sort of architectures. So what are microservice architectures? Well, you know, think of these as small services that communicate together to achieve some larger task. Um, if you want to take away three three thoughts about what a microservice is. The first thing is it's focused around a business domain. That's as the prime way of demarcating a service boundary. This is because we found that those sorts of service demarcations are much more stable. So I'm building a, an e-commerce system. A, a basket is a fairly stable boundary that I might define. Um, they're using a technology agnostic API. Uh, this, this means that I can use different technologies inside that service. They can evolve and change more independently of each other. Uh, and they are small. I don't tend to define small in terms of lines of code. Uh, one of the clients I work with in Australia, they define what a microservice is, is can I rewrite this service in two weeks? That for them is micro. Um, other people try and use lines of code. I don't think that's terribly helpful. I tend to think of the size of a microservice as a maximizer of benefits and a maximizer of complexity too. The smaller your service is, the more benefits you get, the more complexity you get. Um, other people may differ in their definitions of microservices, but if they have a different view, they can write their own book. So um, <laughs> this is how I think about it. Um, this is the really important thing, though, for me, is making sure whatever we create is independently releasable. Whatever it is you're doing with your own version of microservices, as long as these your services remain independently releasable, you're probably doing something right, so that's good. Today I'm going to talk a bit about testing and deploying microservices. I'm actually going to talk a bit more about deployment um, mostly because that's such a fast emerging space, and also look at testing. How do I make sure the software I'm deploying actually works in some way, shape, or form? And decomposed systems like microservices present us with some interesting challenges. But we'll start off looking at the aspect of deployment. One of the first conversations I end up having, especially in working with clients that are migrating towards microservices from larger monolithic systems, is this question. Should I have one service per host or multiple services per host? On the far right, we have a pattern here that, that people that sell you Java servlet containers or in the .NET space with IIS with like, where I have multiple services running on one big host. Um, and this other world, it's the world I prefer, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between a service and a host. The prime benefits, I think, of the service-to-host mapping is it's significantly easier to reason about. And in a distributed system, you have enough sources of complexity without adding some more. That one-to-one -one mapping is very easy to think about. It's much easier to provision those services, too, because you can actually tie together provisioning of the host and provisioning of the service. You also have significantly fewer side effects. 
if one of my services goes berserk and chews up 100% of the CPU, it's only affecting itself. It's not going to be taking out other things. And also, it enforces interdependence. Actually, having the division of a process boundary is useful for thinking about how we modularize our software. So, too, can having a separate service boundary. It really keeps us honest, actually. But there are some key downsides. One of them is, well, upsides, actually, for the multi-service per host view. In the multi-service per host world, we actually have a lower host management overhead. And if you're in an organization where you cannot provision your host automatically, this might be a world you live in, it actually can also be significantly cheaper. We're going to talk about both of those issues and try and find a way around them to actually allow us to stay in that one service per host world. So the first thing we should look at is how do we work about reducing that overhead, that, that host management overhead? If you're in a world right now where you manually provision your virtual machines, maybe you go into vCenter and you click some buttons and up pops a virtual machine, the prospect of spinning lots of uh, virtual machines up to support a microservices world where you've got one service per host mapping is pretty daunting. So the key, actually, doesn't matter what platform you pick, is to find a platform that allows you to provision hosts using an API. I, say, I don't say automatic, I always say API, because some systems claim to be automatic and give you a nice GUI, right? So I can automatically click some buttons to produce a virtual machine. I mean API. We want to write code to bring these things up. So that's the first thing we can do. If we have a platform that allows us to provision these things with code, we can start moving to this one-to-one -one <coughs> mapping world. And there's lots of virtualization platforms out there that support these things. Believe it or not, VMware will let you write APIs to provision virtual machines. Nobody ever does it, because normally you've got some very expensive consultants who look after vCenter for you and who won't let you near it. But it is possible, actually. You can write code and VMware things pop up. Of course, more commonly, we're looking at something like AWS or DigitalOcean or Rackspace Cloud or Azure, if you want to be kind of weird and Seattle-ish about the whole thing. <laughs> but I can write an API and up pop some piece of compute. This is a great thing. This actually removes this impediment. That then allows us to consider patterns like the standard one we probably all, many of you in this room are using, where I now provision some host. I then configure that host. I install dependencies my software might have. I install the right version of Java. I might install Apache or something like that. And then I install my service, and my, my system comes up, and it's running. And my configuration and my software can all be source controlled. I can write code to provision my hosts. And this, hopefully, is not very new. And then probably typically at this point, you'll be doing something like, OK, well, I'll, I'll reapply my puppet recipes or my chef manifests. I get these two things confused. Um, well, we use Ansible. Uh, so I'm using Ansible, and I'm reconfiguring that host and reinstalling new versions of the software over and over again in a sort of semi-permanent way. This is actually not a bad place to go to, especially if right now you're in the world of manual configuration of your machines. There's an interesting thing, though, is all those platforms I talked about that allow me to automatically provision hosts using some API also support um, the concept of images. The ability to bring up a, a version of a running process, or a set of running processes, all pre-configured. Because that's what you do anyway. When you launch a virtual machine, you get an operating system with some software installed. And then we sit around for 15 minutes installing more software. Well, why don't we just package that whole thing up and say, this is now my artifact. This is the thing I care about. All of those platforms have tools that allow you to do this, but they're all slightly funky tool chains. Um, Netflix have their own tool chain they put on top of the AMI creation tools, for example. Um, Pack has come along quite recently. HashiCorp, in my eyes, can do no wrong. And one of the things they released recently is a tool that actually allows you to create images with sort of a more abstract tool chain. You can actually just use the Chef, Puppet, Ansible playbooks you already have. So I can take these things that I would use to configure my machine, and I can automate. So I bring up a host, I run my Puppet or my Chef stuff, and then I use the, the Packer work to actually produce me an image. And I can actually use it to produce an image for me on AWS, on DigitalOcean, on OpenStack, on VMware. And uh, we're doing a couple of projects internally where we're using this to actually use the same uh, Ansible playbooks to create both VMware images and also AWS images. It's working really well for us. It actually can also create me vagrant images. And I'm trying to think about testing uh, a system, especially a system like a microservice system, bringing up production-like stacks is really important. 
Uh, Vagrant giving me a cloud on my box is useful. In the past, it was a bit of a pain to create images for this. But now I can use the same tool chain that would create me an image on Amazon to actually create me a Vagrant image that can run on my local machine, which really improves the feedback cycles. This sort of image-based deployment, where effectively the artifact I'm thinking about and managing is an image rather than, say, a software package, has some interesting benefits. Firstly, it really helps us uh, implement what we call the immutable servers pattern, which I'll talk about in a moment. These things also have a very, very fast spin-up time. I, it, uh, once I've launched that image, my software's already running. There's no delay. So if you're thinking about an environment where you're auto-scaling, for example, you need to spin up nodes to accommodate load, this is really key. Sometimes when you install a node, you launch a node, and the first thing you do is run your, your puppet scripts on it. It can take 10, 15 minutes to converge. It's putting down all the different things you need. And that's also a bad feedback cycle if you're just trying to bring up a node to test against as well. They also give you some level of provider agnosticism here, which is kind of interesting. Packers always give me a bit of an abstraction layer over the underlying platforms. There are some downsides. Feedback can actually suffer. The times to build images on some of these platforms can take quite a while. Rackspace's cloud, for example, it can take 20 minutes to build a virtual machine image. That's a long time to wait. And that's a, that's a build time spent, but it still can be a delay. And it can have impact on cycle time. If I have an entire fleet of CentOS images running, uh, and I suddenly realize that I've got to patch OpenSSH, because hypothetically, let's say someone found a critical vulnerability in OpenSSH, and I've got to fix it quick. Now I've got to go and rebuild a whole load of images and start rolling out those images just to apply a library level patch change. And that means I've also got to deprovision those services as I go. That, for some environments, that can be killer. But anyway, it, I really like this pattern. We started using this uh, for a few of our clients and using it internally as well. I mentioned about the immutable server pattern. Um, this is the idea. So when you set up a host and you're running your automated configuration tools, and they're running away, whirring away, installing new versions and patches. What you're hoping to achieve is that what's in source control is what's on your box. However, if you leave a machine up and running for a period of time, people log into it, and they monkey around, and they do things. And over time, that machine drifts, you know, configuration drift. It doesn't now match what's in production. And over time, it becomes a beautiful snowflake. And even with the best will in the world, unless you are blowing that machine out of the water on a regular basis, this will happen. With the immutable server pattern, it takes this to an extreme. We never touch that box again once it's launched. If you want to push out a change, we blow the box away and we bring up a new one. Every release, we do that. So if you're doing 10 deployments a day of your software, that's 10 different images that are flowing out, that are popping up. And you can do interesting things like make sure that your image doesn't even have SSH running on it. So no one can even log on to the box to do anything bad. It's a really interesting pattern. It's worth looking at. OK, so we can do some API management and these images. And that helps lower the cost of sort of the API host management stuff. So that helps us stick to that one host per server pattern. We need to talk a bit about cost. Why is this pattern often called expensive? Why do we sometimes consider that having one service per host is expensive? A lot of it's to do with how virtualization works. This is a diagram that should be familiar to any of you who understand what type 2 virtualization is. is. And if you do understand type 2 virtualization, please come and explain it to me afterwards. Um, but basically, it more or less works like this. There's a machine with a, an operating system, and there's a thing called a hypervisor that vises stuff hyperly. And um, <laughs> one of the things it does, I understand, is mediate between the virtual machine and the real physical machine under the hood. And that's great. The issue is that these hypervisors actually add an overhead in terms of the computing resources that they require. They actually chew up CPU and memory for effectively mapping between the virtual machine and the physical machine. So it's like you take a big machine, and then you pass it up in lots of virtual machines, and you pay up an overhead for having that level of isolation. Um, this actually, uh, and, and so this actually can be a significant cost. One of the things that you can do to solve this is to try to use a different type of technology, one called containers. So LXC uh, is an example of this technology. Rather than having completely separated virtual machines with some mapping layer that maps between the virtual and the physical resources, containers actually take a much more lightweight approach. They're for Linux only. What they do is they say that each of the containers that runs on my machine shares my kernel, 
And rather than having a, a fat white hypervisor sitting between me and the physical machine, I'm effectively just going to say each container is like a separate arm of a, a separate process space. So think of the process space in Linux like a set of trees, and your container just want, lives on one of those branches. And then the container software stops you, hope, theoretically, from being able to break outside of the container. They are nowhere near as isolated as virtual machines. You shouldn't consider these things as bulletproof, that there's no way of getting outside of them, because there is. So you have to be aware of those downsides. But nonetheless, they have, significant, have significantly less overhead. You can pack more of them on a machine. Uh, and they are extremely fast to provision. They can take a couple of seconds to spin up and spin down. Um, we use this quite extensively when we took our Mingle tool. We, we basically re-architected it to work on the cloud. We rolled out our SaaS products. We actually took quadruple extra large Amazon instances and then just stuck a whole lot of LXC containers on top of them. One of the downsides is that you're on your own when you're really managing these containers. You've got like libvirt or something that lets you control them, but there aren't, there's not much stuff on top that really helps you work with these ineffectively. And this is actually where something like Docker comes in. The way Docker works is it actually introduces a couple of new concepts for us. Um, so with Docker, you have your virtual machine, your base operating system, and then you have the Docker libraries themselves. They used to use LXC under the hood. They've now got their own container library. And then rather than thinking about these big, fat virtual machines that I'm putting on, I'm effectively just putting on an application that has some associated libraries and a very small host operating system inside it that I'm deploying onto that stack. Docker itself then also introduces this concept of an image re registry. This is where my applications are stored. It handles versioning for me. So I can actually say, install this version of my app. It can do rollbacks, because you can just push an earlier version. It also does some funky deltering stuff, too. So it will, you know, when I'm upgrading my software, it, can, it actually only writes the bits and bytes that are different. So it actually makes deploying these things fairly fast. It's a really neat model. Um, so effectively, your image registry, if you're thinking about a build pipeline, and um, with Docker um, apps as your artifacts, you can be storing those in the registry and pushing them out when you need to. Uh, Core OS is kind of interesting. It's a very lightweight um, uh, Linux operating system that is just designed for hosting Docker. There's nothing else on there. Uh, they claim that they shave like 40% off the overhead of a normal, um, guest, uh, normal host operating system. I haven't done the stats myself, but it's quite interesting. So literally, you install Core OS and Docker's there for you. Um, and they're doing some really interesting stuff around software-defined networking. They just announced Rudder a couple of days ago, which looks quite interesting in terms of how you map uh, your networking through to these Docker containers. One of the nice things is that Packer can actually create Docker images for you, which is kind of nice. It's kind of, kind of fun. So it actually gives you a really nice migration path, because the Docker world is quite scary. If you're in a world right now where you're not even blowing away your images and you're just doing the manual, OK, let's run my puppet scripts again. So you can start off with these semi-permanent servers, bringing up a host and then reapplying them to install my software. And then when you get comfortable with that model, well, then you can move on to doing things like image-based deployments to allow you to implement the immutable server pattern. And then once you've got happy with that, if you're using Packer to create those images, you can then go the next hog and say, OK, well, rather than producing myself a, an AWS uh, um, sort of uh, image, let's create a Docker app instead and start experimenting in that world. You can have a nice migration path. Um, I, you know, I would suggest having cutting your teeth a little bit on Docker in dev and test before you try using it in production. Oh, so that's good. So we've now you know, we've decided we're going to Dockerize the world. Uh, we're going to think about our service and our host as being effectively a single artifact that we're creating and deploying. But how do we make sure that this software that we're deploying into this brave new world actually works and actually functions? Because the world of testing is kind of a bit more tricky when we think about microservices. So think about what we mean by testing when we think about testing a single monolithic application. Well, I have small tests, like unit tests, um, one of the worst named things in the world. But then there's very small scope tests that maybe test one function, uh, one piece of behavior inside my monolith. Very small scope things, very fast feedback. And I have these sort of larger scope tests that, that maybe test a bit more integration. So I'm testing things in my database. And then I have, of course, the dreaded end-to-end -end tests where I'm testing all this scope. Right, maybe I'm bringing up a browser and I'm doing everything together. It's a fantastic world. And what we're doing here is we're trying to build up a whole, we're trying to have a balanced portfolio. Probably most of you have seen the test pyramid. So laying on different scopes of tests to catch bugs in different ways. With microservices, though, 
I've got lots of independent processes talking to other independent processes over the wire, communicating in different ways. So obviously I can test within my service boundary just like I would from a monolithic system, but ultimately I have to know what impact my software is going to have when I deploy it. So if I'm changing my inventory service, how do I know that I haven't broken something? There's really a couple of key cases I need to look at that are a bit different here. Firstly, is how do I work with my downstream collaborators? So here, how do I work with my account system? And also, how do I make sure that I haven't broken the people that consume me as a service? How do I know I haven't broken the shipping service when I deploy? And these, are really just the two, these are the only two key problems you have to worry about, really, when you get down to it. Let's talk a little bit first off about just inventory in the account system. When I'm looking at changing inventory, and I want to make sure I haven't broken a downstream collaborator. Now, as many of you know with testing, one of the key challenges is always to look at isolation. So I want to test the thing in as small a scope as possible. So when I'm actually looking at making a change to inventory, I don't really need to talk to the real accounts thing, because the account service hasn't changed. I just need to know, in making the changes I have made, have I changed how I work with the account system in a way that concerns me or confuses me? Uh, bringing up stubs is typically the answer here. Now, if you're writing microservices that are using something like REST over um, HTTP, you can stub um, endpoints with all kinds of software. You know, it's Python, simple HTTP server is one of my favorites. Um, there's actually a really nice tool from a colleague of mine called Mountbank. Mountbank's actually a little Node.js software appliance. And it pops up, and you talk to it over a port, and you tell it to mock other ports. And you can say, come up on port 5555 as a TCP server, and when you get this communication, send this response. And you can actually run mount back and have it stub out multiple different ports. You can actually have it play the part of many different downstream uh, collaborators. And so you can just use mount bank or some other type of software to stub out my account service from my test against that in isolation. It can be much faster. When a test fails, I know it's going to be down to the change I've made in the inventory service. This is actually a very simple world when you get down to it. We look at something else that's more complicated with my upstream world, when I've got the shipping services talking to me. How do I know when I've made a change to inventory that I haven't broken my consumer? And this is actually the more complicated scenario. Because I don't necessarily know how shipping service talks to me. And so normally we would solve this in a traditional world where we had two or three moving parts with an end-to-end -end test. We'd deploy all these running services, and we'd run a load of tests over them. And I've got a test there. That's nice, that's great. A couple of moving parts. And then you start looking at the larger system, and I've got, I've got you know, tests. Now I need some tests there, and I need some tests there. <laughs> this is a small number of services I've got up here. I, I advise all of you, if you're interested in this journey, start with a small number. Go from one to two to three to five to whatever. One of my clients in Melbourne has been on this journey for five years. They have more microservices now than people. This stuff does not scale. These end-to-end -end tests to get these odd, huge, horrendous Cartesian products of attempting to match all these things together. These are big, nasty things to deal with. I'm sure some of you have had these integration tests, these end-to-end -end tests that have been problematic with significantly fewer numbers of services than I've even got on the screen here. The problem with these end-to-end -end tests is we've got so many moving parts. Maybe we're bringing up real browsers, and browsers crash for no reason, as anybody who can tell you who's ever done browse the web will tell you. And when they crash for no reason when you're running a test, is it the browser or is it my software? Timing, especially if you've got any asynchronicity in your functionality, just timing effects can sometimes show a test has failed when it hasn't. Uh, provisioning of environments can be slow and can sometimes fail, even on the hallowed grounds of Amazon. Every now and then a node won't come up for no apparent reason. Uh, networks, if anyone's ever read the fallacies of distributed computing, we all know that the network is not and never shall be reliable. It will fail, and with a microservice architecture, we've effectively exposed ourselves to more failure points. So that's going to be a problem. Deployment sometimes falls over, and diagnosing the problem after all of that is difficult. That's why these end-to-end -end tests can be so challenging to get right. So a nicer way of thinking about this, again, is to come back to that concept of isolation. How can I actually test my inventory service by itself and still make sure I haven't broken my collaborators? One way of doing this is with consumer-driven contracts. I take my shipping service. They define a set of expectations as code. I then run those tests, those expectations, and part of my build. So whenever I run my test as the inventory service, I validate 
that those expectations are correct. So if, my, if these tests break, I know I've broken an expectation a consumer has of me, and I can stop before I deploy my software. Uh, there's a piece of software written by one of our clients uh, called Pact, and there the expectations get defined by the consumers, and the output of that is a binary artifact. And then me, as the inventory service, I pull in that binary artifact as a dependency and run that as part of my build. And so those tests become like a living thing that I keep hold of. As a side effect, it also generates a stub service for the consumers to use. It's a really interesting tool. It's well worth a look. They've got a Ruby version, and they've done a port to the JVM. Um, so that's a really interesting tool to look at. So no integration tests? Well, clearly not, because they are some use to them. We'll get on to that in a moment. If you are going to do these end-to-end -end integration tests, though, please think about journeys and think about a very, very small number. Think about five or six key journeys through your system that mimic the key flows that your user has. If yours are an e-commerce site selling all kinds of products, maybe you have one journey that says, can I buy a CD? And keep it to a very, very small number. Some organizations do get rid of these things altogether. My biggest challenge, though, and it may be a challenge I'm going to throw back to many of you, is we spend a lot of time talking about testing. And when we're testing, we're validating, does my software work before I release it? That's we spend all of our time doing this, and at some point later, hopefully it gets into production. And in the production world, we have a whole load of other activities that normally fall under like monitoring and alerting and escalation and remediation. And in this side of the world, we have testers that think about testing stuff. And in this world, we have operations -y people that think about operating on stuff. This is completely broken, in my view. I think we need to think a bit more broadly about testing. I want to bring back the term quality analyst as somebody who looks at the holistic quality of my software, both pre-release pre and post-release. Because this is what we, most of us do. We actually have this balance. We spend all of our time, especially in the agile community, thinking an awful lot about testing our software, and very little time thinking about the implications of what happens when it hits production. Here's the problem. At scale, you are not going to catch all problems before they hit production. At scale in terms of load, at scale in terms of moving parts. With microservice architectures, there's a lot more emergent behavior that comes out. You are not going to tap down all those issues. And you're sometimes much better paid off by actually fixing those in production or tracking them in production in the first place. So for example, one of our, um, the client that actually wrote PAX, they don't do any integration testing for, their new, for the newer services, none. They go straight into production when they want. They do some consumer-driven contract tests, and they go straight into production. They actually push to a test environment after production. The reason they do that is if they find a problem, they want an environment running with the latest version of the software where they can go and play around with it. It took them five years to get to that model. They didn't start overnight. Please don't start overnight. But gradually, it is possible. And removing those testing constraints and having the same people thinking about the balance between testing and monitoring really helps. If they're separate people, you're never going to know where that balance is. And I think, actually, the more you are going from monolithic systems to finer grain services, the more you're going to have to look at maybe spending a bit more of your time thinking about the monitoring and alerting. It's not necessarily, though, a zero-sum game. And actually, some of the work you do around testing can help you in the monitoring, in the monitoring and alerting space. Those journeys I mentioned, those journey tests, why not run them in production? Why not check I can order a CD every five minutes? Because you know what? The fact that one single node is down in a microservice architecture may or may not be a problem. You don't know. Just monitoring your CPU and your memory and doesn't cut it. In a monolithic system, that's fine. Your CPU is at 100%. You know there's a problem. Your overall system is compromised. The microservice architecture, you do not know that. So take that test that just orders a CD and run it in production every five minutes. This is either, some people call it semantic monitoring, some people call it synthetic transactions. It's a really good idea. I've used it many times myself. And in a microservice architecture, it's the best way of finding out if something's wrong. It's actually saying, can my system fulfill what my users need it to do? And maybe you can do that by monitoring user behavior, but if you can't, provoke it into anger. Do make sure that these tests you run in production don't have any unforeseen artifacts, uh, any, any unforeseen side effects, though, because, well, there was a, company in Germany, I was heard a great story from, they ran their tests, uh, there was like an e-commerce company, they unfortunately ran their tests against the production fulfillment system. And actually these fake orders with this canned data were actually flowing into the warehouse. And 
200 washing machines were ordered and a whole truck arrived outside their head office with all these washing machines in the back. And the problem apparently was it wasn't picked up until they were loading up the third truck back at the warehouse. So if you are going to run these sort of these tests in production like that, do make sure that they're, they're not actually going to go and do crazy things like that. So I think we're about coming up on time. But there's a few things I want you to take away with you when you're thinking about this stuff in the microservice way. In the deployment space, try and move as quickly as you can towards the one server per host model. It makes things simple. And microservice architectures are complicated enough as it is without you making it more complicated. This is a simpler, simpler conceptual model. So look at the, some of those technologies to help you get there, avoiding some of the management overheads that are associated with multiple hosts and also the cost implications. Once you're there, consider things like image-based deployments. Again, it becomes even simpler. It can actually speed up some of the feedback cycles. Your software gets launched and is live much faster. And also really strongly consider implementing the immutable server pattern. The really interesting thing is that once you're in this world, all of that software, like Ansible, Chef, and Puppet, which has a lot of work done around it to make sure you can run it multiple times in an idempotent fashion on the same node, you don't need that anymore. I've spoken to multiple people that have gone on that journey and ripped out Puppet and replaced it all again with Bash scripts. Because if I'm bringing out that node once and once only and I'm never running those scripts ever again, the declarative nature of those systems isn't required. And in the testing space, Stop thinking about testing as a pre-release activity. Think about it more holistically and saying, is my system functioning and will my system function? Think instead about your pre-release validation. With microservice tests, that means looking at single service tests in isolation for that fast feedback. Maybe a small number of journey tests, but look to use consumer-driven contracts to really pick up those breaking changes as early as possible. And also then think about post-release validation. Take some of those testing smarts and have those actually applied in those worlds, those monitoring and alerting worlds. We talk about dev and ops with you know, the developer world and the operations world working together, and that's fantastic. I wonder how many of your, your organizations have QAs or testers that aren't also being brought across that barrier. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm work, writing a book called Building Microservices, which is a dream of mine to have an animal book for my mind, and I've now got it, <laughs> and these are awesome. Um, I'm going to be signing copies of the early access version out there in about uh, like 320, you know, only 20 copies of the book. Most of you have also got like a little free ebook flyer, I think, that you should have got in your pack to go and use that to buy my book. Or if you have to, you can buy Jason Barry. Thank you very much. <laughs>